Retroviruses are a really interesting group of viruses that have a very unique replication strategy compared to those that we've discussed before. Retroviruses are enveloped positive sense strand RNA viruses. And hopefully you're going, yeah, we've talked about those before. That's not very unique, but I promise they are unique. Now what they do is they have their own particular enzyme that they make called an RNA dependent DNA polymerase. What this enzyme does is it reads RNA as a template and synthesizes a DNA molecule. So remember in transcription, we read DNA and transcribe an RNA molecule. So this is the reverse of that process. So this enzyme is sometimes also called reverse transcriptase. The RNA is reverse transcribed into DNA. That DNA then integrates into the host chromosome. And the discovery of retroviruses and how they replicate did win the Nobel Prize. We use reverse transcriptase in uh, diagnostics. We've talked about reverse transcription PCR. It's the same enzyme. It's turning that RNA as a template into a DNA molecule that can be analyzed. So we do take advantage of the basic biology of retroviruses to do diagnostics, to do lots of molecular work. Um, so if you've ever wondered, well, where did reverse transcriptase come from? That's where it came from. The first retrovirus isolated um, causes chicken tumors, Rouse sarcoma. But retroviruses are really interesting. They have um, very limited host ranges. But what we'll see later is that they mutate pretty readily, which has allowed them to jump from some species into others. Many retroviruses can cause cancer, so they can be classified as oncoviruses. And this is the big hint right here, that the DNA integrates into the host chromosome. If it integrates into the host chromosome in a place that inactivates a necessary gene like p53 or any of those tumor suppressor genes or if it integrates in such a way that you now have overexpression um, of an oncogene you can have cancer formation the first human disease uh, that was caused by a retrovirus is a type of um, T-cell lymphotrophic disease, and the virus was a human T-cell lymphotrophic virus number one. But this is, of course, not the most famous or infamous of the retroviruses. So what happened during the early to mid-1980s was um, a particular subset of people, patients, that were... I guess kind of sarcastically called the 4-H club, were dying of opportunistic infections. And so the 4-H club were heroin users, hemophiliacs, homosexuals, and Haitians. Um, because we have to blame somebody, so let's blame the drug users, members of the LGBT community, and people from another country. So they called it the 4-H club. The hemophiliacs were thought of as, um, you know, it was accidental because hemophiliacs needed a lot of blood transfusions and because all of that quote unquote dirty blood got in the blood supply from all of the bad people that developed this disease, um, they just happened to contaminate, you know, the blood for the hemophiliacs. Of course, we now know that that's a really terrible way to think about disease, um, but that is how we, and I don't mean we like me personally because I was a very small child and I didn't think about it, but we as society, the government, thought about disease. So in these patients that were dying of these opportunistic infections, doctors called it acquired immunodeficiency syndrome because these patients had been healthy and then all of a sudden they were getting these super weird fungal infections 
They were developing cancers that you almost never saw and their immune system had basically disappeared. And so the abbreviation for that is AIDS. Eventually, scientists were able to isolate um, two very related viral strains that we now call human immunodeficiency virus one and human immunodeficiency virus two, HIV. Um, and for a long time, people thought that the jump from primates to people happened really close to the 1980s because that's when we really saw the boom of patients. But a lot of genetic work, a lot of you know, phylogenetic analysis demonstrated that humans most likely acquired the infection from uh, chimpanzees or sooty, I don't know how to pronounce that, mangabees, uh, another type of primate um, in the early 20th century. Um, so these primates get a virus called simian immunodeficiency virus. And so it's thought really through the consumption of what's called bush meat. So just whatever, you know, you're able to catch and eat. Uh, so people who are catching and eating um, primates. And so it's now pretty widely accepted that HIV got into people uh, in the 1920s in uh, Kinshasa, which is part of now is like the Democratic Republic of Congo. There are other retroviruses that we do see in people um, and other animals. They're called endogenous retroviruses that have integrated into our chromosome and been maintained throughout our evolutionary history. And it's estimated that, you know, these remnants of our previous viral infections make up up to 8% of our genome. And there are other animals that have them as well. So the, the example I'm thinking of is pigs. Pigs have them. And these endogenous retroviruses in different species, so human versus pig, actually are one of the really important complicating factors for why, um, as of right now, you can't transplant pig organs into people. So yes, of course, the human immune system will recognize pig cells and be like, oh, that's not one of ours. But scientists are using CRISPR to work on that problem. But the other problem is these endogenous retroviruses from one species and another, when they come into contact, they like start to activate and do really weird stuff. So in order to transplant a pig organ into a person, you'd have to remove all of the pig retroviruses and all of the pig cell immune markers. And so scientists are using CRISPR to try to make pigs that can be used to transplant organs into people basically by eliminating, at least in part, eliminating all of these endogenous retroviruses in the pig. In the group of retroviruses, there are three subfamilies. Um, there are some that are the Oncovirinae. These are the ones that are more likely to cause cancer. There's the Lentivirinae. That's where HIV is. Um, these, sometimes called lentiviruses, uh, don't usually cause cancer. They can make you more susceptible to certain kinds of cancer, but they don't usually cause cancer. And, and then there's the spuma virinae, which causes um, a disease called human foamy virus. It doesn't really seem to have any effect on the body, but it makes macrophages look like they have big vacuoles in them. So your oncovirinae, uh, your lentivirinae, and your spuma virinae, and then of course all of your endogenous retroviruses. So no known clinical disease, but foamy, like vacuolated uh, cytopathology, the lentivirinae, slow onset of disease, neurological disorders and immune suppression, HIV, um, viruses and other animals, and then your oncovirinae. Um, so your human T cell lymphotrophic virus, your Rouse sarcoma virus in chickens, etc. So the retroviruses are classified by the type of disease they cause, their tissue tropism, their host range, their morphology, and their complexity. And like I mentioned, the oncovirinae are really only the ones that can transform cells or turn them into cancer. The lentivirinae are the ones that are associated with what we think of as, as AIDS. So because 
they have this really unique type of replication. They have to have their own reverse transcriptase. They generally carry it with them. So you can see that kind of, it's, they're trying to illustrate it here in this diagram of the virion. Um, here's the RNA and it has this reverse transcriptase protein that it made in its previous cell and carries with it so that when it infects the new cell, um, it can not only begin transcription, but it can also reverse transcribe its RNA to be integrated into uh, the host DNA. The genetics are not very complex. The genome is only about 9,000 kilobases, or I'm sorry, 9,000 bases or nine kilobases. Um, and there are only a handful of proteins. So as I mentioned, the virus will get into the cell. Um, we'll talk about the receptors in just a minute. This is, I think, trying to show you um, a couple of different ones, but I think this one is supposed to be HIV. This might be a different one. Um, so they get in, release their genomic RNA. The RNA is reverse transcribed into DNA, um, which at first is linear. It then circularizes, goes into the nucleus, and then integrates um, into the host chromosome. So the virus also makes its own enzyme called integrase that allows for that integration to occur. Then once the viral genetic material, so the DNA that represents the viral genome, has been integrated into the host chromosome, it can then be transcribed um, and exported from the nucleus where some of it can serve as the genetic material for new virions, and some of it can serve as the template for protein synthesis. So I want you to really think about this and kind of think about some of the unique features I've talked about and how those could potentially be exploited as retroviral treatments. The major receptor, so how this is specifically about HIV. So we're really going to talk about HIV because that's the most common retrovirus that you're going to see um, in any sort of clinical setting. So the most um, common receptor, the one that is used most frequently, is um, a receptor called CCR5. It's a chemokine receptor found on the surface of CD4 positive T cells and macrophages. So what they're trying to show in this cartoon is that you, know, you first have the recognition of the host cell by the HIV virion. Um, it uses a protein called GP120 to recognize the CD4 molecule on the surface of the cell. Um, and then it can interact uh, with the chemokine receptor as well. So they're like co-receptors. And then you get the entry of the virus into the host cell. In a later stage of infection, uh, they could use a different uh, receptor called CXCR4. But again, we're primarily talking about CCR5. CCR5 delta 32 is a mutation found in, uh, like I've read something like 10% of people of Scandinavian descent. Um, and then in people of European descent, it's approximately 1%. Um, and what this is, is it's a 32 base pair deletion in the gene encoding CCR5. Uh, that deletion leads to a premature stop codon um, and then basically a lack of a functional CCR5. When a patient is homozygous for CCR5 delta 32, they don't make any functional uh, CCR5, they are resistant to the most common strain of HIV, which is HIV-1. If a patient is heterozygous, meaning they have one Delta 32 and one regular CCR5, um, there's like a 50% reduction in the number of CCR5 receptors. And so they are, I don't wanna say resistant, but it's harder for them to get the infection. Those of you who follow like biotechnology news may have heard about a case out of China where a researcher actually was doing CRISPR on human embryos, and he was trying to make human embryos that had this particular mutation so that they would be resistant to HIV. 
Um, he was not successful in doing that, but he sure did do CRISPR on embryos that were born into children. Again, the ethics are um, non-existent in that case, but that, that was the goal. So again, there is a subset of people who are resistant to HIV-1 because of that mutation. 